My name is Kaylin Hogan. I'm author of Republic of Shame. In the bleak first hours of a new year, the park across from the house where I grew up was empty and wild in the darkness. There had been a holy family row, a sour beginning, and my mother had suggested we go and walk it off. The paths and fields of the Rockies, as locals called Rockfield Park, were so familiar that my feet walked them without my mind having to pay any attention. The local priest, Father Gohan, was often to be seen sashaying through the park in his dramatic black soutane and white collar. As my mother, my younger brother and I walked, we could see a high wall on the flank of the park. Set into the wall were a narrow gate and a little electronic keypad. Mounted on a pole behind the wall was a CCTV camera. Through the bars of the gate, we could spy a stately blush pink building surrounded by manicured slopes and gardens. I knew vaguely that the nuns lived in there. I started writing the book in 2017, which was a few years after the marriage equality referendum, where this quite painful conversation had come up again about who gets to be a family. And I think there were stories being told, people were speaking about their experiences of, of being shamed for not being, you know, what was thought of as the acceptable family. And then we were looking ahead as well to the repeal referendum, which was bringing up a lot of stories of how the church and the state had treated pregnant people in this country, had treated women and their children. So all of this was happening at the time when I started thinking about writing this book. And the minute I started speaking to people I knew about it, they had their own stories. And I realized how recently this was, that this you know, affected people of my own generation, even younger than me, um, some whose mothers who'd been born in or sent to the institutions. And so it was, it was all around me. Then, of course, also realizing the institutions that were local to me that I had never known about but had walked past. That just made it feel very urgent to write about this in this moment. A few years after that New Year walk with my mother, I found myself strolling up the winding lane that leads to the blush pink building on my way for tea with the provincial head of the Daughters of Charity. In the preceding months, I had learned a few things about this part of Dublin, Black Rock, and about the Daughters. I knew, for instance, that the Order had purchased part of the Rockfield estate a few years after the establishment of the Irish Free State. I knew too that the Daughters had for many decades operated St. Patrick's Home on the Navan Road in Cabra. The women of the religious orders, once held in reverence, were now widely seen as cruel and bitter about their waning influence. I grew up just across the road from the Rockies, Rockfield Park, uh, where we are now, and across the road from Guardian Angels Church and the primary school where I started school. And growing up here, I never knew um, about the provincial house of the Daughters of Charity that was just across the road, or the institution where thousands of children were adopted from on Temple Hill, St. Patrick's Infant Hospital. So when I began to write the book, it was really important for me in the first chapter to just show how close to home these institutions were. My dad grew up in this area too, and. I guess no one spoke about it and no one really knew uh, that it was there and yet I found out through reporting, through writing this book, that people I knew personally had been separated from children in that institution or had been adopted from there. Every neighborhood, every town in Ireland, you know, kind of had a place locally um, where people were sent in silence and in secret. While I was growing up here, I went to Guardian Angels School. I um, did my communion in Guardian Angels Church. And, you know, just a few doors up from where I, I lived, where I grew up as a kid, um, there's a priest called Father Gotten, and uh, I actually interview him in the book. He um, turned out to have worked in one of the Magdalene laundries in Dublin. And I remember asking him about what he thought at the time of, of how women were sent to these institutions and you know, whether he ever felt the need to speak up. 
just a few hundred meters from the Daughters of Charity's provincial house, set back from a road called Temple Hill on the slope leading down to Dublin Bay, stands a stately old Georgian manor. Today, Neptune House is surrounded by a ring of freshly built houses, a gated community with fancy cars on the drives. Neptune House had a long and colorful history. It had been home to the Earl known as Copperface Jack. It had been used as a shelter for British troops sent to put down the Easter Rising. But I wanted to know more about what went on there from the time the first baby was admitted. So people knew, knew it was there in some ways, but it wasn't spoken about. People knew that there was an institution there and you know, must have seen children coming and going. Some people in the locality would have gone in and actually taken children out for walks. Despite its claim to be a hospital, it accommodated babies not because they were sick, but because they were awaiting adoption. The babies were mostly born to unmarried mothers. The first baby was admitted in October 1930. During the 1930s, Miss Cruz described the Guild as catering to expectant mothers of the better class, genuine first offenders. In the 1960s, after construction of a new annex, Temple Hill was able to house close to 100 babies. A lot of women and children were coming and going, and yet my father, who grew up just up the road, knew nothing about the institution. Beyond the institutions that were close to my house, uh, Madonna House was one place uh, near Black Rock, which was an orphanage, a so-called orphanage, run by the Sisters of Charity. Uh, in Dunleary, there was a Magdalene Laundry. Um, although they still don't know uh, where women who died there are buried. There were uh, orphanages as well, institutions um, run by, by Protestant orders in Dunleary as well. The whole area is steeped in this history as a sort of a place that was middle class, that was, you know, a, a suburbs where uh, things could be in some ways hidden away. I think writing the book, I really came to realize how easily a system of institutions like this that punished women and their children because of stigma, that called women offenders, and you see that in black and white in the records of church and state, that women were called offenders, they were called penitents, and how easily this system was normalized and for how long. We see the ongoing barriers that survivors face uh, to access their own birth information. People adopted in this country still don't have the right to their own original birth cert or, and their identity. So we are still perpetuating a culture of silence in this country. We need to look today at how we might be re repeating or perpetuating a system like that um, and how we accept what we might in the future see as unacceptable. Thank you.